Take your Bible this morning, turn to the book of Titus chapter 2, and let's stand together. Ushers, bring folks in from the lobbies. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. And uh, we are having our services at 8.30 and 10.30, and there's always some that still kind of on that 11 o'clock schedule. So get them in here and get everybody seated. Don't sit. Yeah, we're going to stay standing, but get them a seat anyways. And turn in your Bible to Titus chapter 2, and we're going to read this morning beginning in verse number 13. Now, as I said a moment ago, we're preaching a series right now of messages entitled Things to Come, Things to Come. And we're learning about biblical prophecy. Most of you should have had a little note page somewhere when you walked in that might help you along the way. And I encourage you to use that today. Now, before I read the scripture, let me have your attention real quickly. Next Sunday is one of the great Sundays on the calendar every year at Lancaster Baptist Church. And it is our Public Servants Appreciation Day first responders. And uh, I want you to be praying for this service. I want to encourage you to invite a friend, whether they're a nurse, a doctor, an LVN, whether they work in a hospital or a, maybe a, a senior care home, whether they are a police officer or a fighter fighter. Let me tell you something very quickly. Medical workers are weary right now, and they need encouragement, and we intend to encourage them next Sunday. And uh, I've invited my doctor and his wife. They've committed to come, and I believe your doctor would come or nurse if you would simply ask. 
there's a lot of folks, they know our church has been involved with the Samaritan's Purse Hospital. They know that we've got a, a larger church family. There's a lot of folks that would come if you would ask. And that's how it works. I mean, Jesus said, follow me. You know, you have to invite somebody. So on your way out, the ushers are going to have these cards. And uh, ushers, if you'll check, I did not see a table in the West Wing, but I want these on the table out there. These are just little cards for first responders. By the way, can I just tell you something? Our police officers need to be encouraged as well. And uh, we should say amen to that. This, this whole, this era in which we're living with all the race baiting and people trying to get everybody mad at each other and everybody mad at the police. Listen, every once in a while there's a preacher that does something bad. I don't want to have all preachers judged by that. That's not the way it should be. And uh, this idea that people are castigating police officers, we intend to do what we have done for 35 years. We intend to bring them up on this platform and honor them next Sunday morning. And I want all of you to help me with that because our first responders, our doctors, nurses, police officers, firefighters, they need to know that there's a bunch of people that still appreciate them. Everybody needs to know that. So pray for the service next, 10, next week at 1030. Bring a friend, especially. Look, if you got, if you got to get pulled over and get a ticket, do what you got to do to invite somebody, all right? But uh, let's, let's do our part, and uh, let's have a friend here next Sunday morning, and be here on time, be here ready to go. It's going to be a great day. And, and then I want to ask you this. How many of you will pray for me this week as I get the message ready? Would you do that? I really appreciate it. And uh, listen, you say, you've preached so much, you can just do it. You just probably just, oh, you probably just say what you want to say. It'll come out. Listen, I need God's power every time I stand behind this pulpit right here. I don't take that for granted, and I need your prayer. And even next Sunday while I'm preaching, you can pray for me, okay? So that's next Sunday. Don't forget. And so it'll be a little different service next Sunday. But for these upcoming months, we're preaching on things to come. And this morning, I am so excited about this message on the subject, a sudden disappearance or the rapture of the church. And this is a great subject in prophecy. And I want you're going to see it's just all over the Bible. So we're going to get right into it right now. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse number 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, notice God and Jesus Christ are synonymous in that verse because Jesus Christ is God. Very important, okay? So looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Somebody said he did a good job of that at Lancaster Baptist, didn't he? A peculiar people. What does that mean? It means a distinct people, different from this world. And then it says, zealous of good works. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for the wonderful crowd this morning of your people coming back week after week. Lord, we're just thankful that we can gather together. Bless those that are still online, maybe with some health needs and so forth. And may we all together just see the great truth that one day we will see you face to face. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, the world's largest library is in Washington, D.C. It is the Library of Congress. How many of you have ever been there? May I see your hands if you've ever been there? If you ever get back to D.C., you ought to go see this building. It is, to me, the most beautiful building, hands down, in all of Washington, D.C. The paintings, the ceiling paintings, the art, and many things about it are wonderful. For example, there is a Gutenberg Bible, the first printed Bible ever. And you have the opportunity to see uh, that Bible, many of the other ancient Bibles, a lot of ancient works and so forth. It's an amazing building. I don't think Nancy Pelosi has a fence around it right now, so get back there while you can. Check it out. Some of you can get that later, but uh, you know what I'm talking about. Just take the opportunity if you're ever back there to see it. And if you do, there is a room in the Library of Congress, and it's known as the Thomas Jefferson Building or Room. And I want to show you a slide of this room. It just uh, gives you a little idea of the grandeur of the building. It's just an amazingly beautiful building. And in that building, in this particular Jefferson Room, there's a wall, and it's uh, the wall dedicated to Tennyson, who is a British poet. And each of the poets, each of the great poets, have one of their most famous writings on the wall in this room. And I want to read to you Tennyson's uh, poem uh, that is listed in his honor. And it says, one God, one law, one element, and one far off divine event to which the whole creation 
moves. One far off divine event to which the whole creation moves. Millions of Christians around the world have looked for a time in world history, a time, a far off event to which the whole world moves, a time that would culminate in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have seen in these last few weeks that there have been various happenings developing with relation to technological, geopolitical movements, organizations such as the uh, European Union, uh, the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. We learned last week that was really a prophetic thing for those who lived prior to that time, an amazing occurrence uh, in the recent history. And we've seen in recent days and even this past week, some of you may have noticed on the Reuters uh, news that uh, Amazon that owns the company Whole Foods will begin this week in Seattle, Washington, a technology where you can walk into Whole Foods, give them your credit card, and from now on, you can simply place your hand on a scanner and your palm will allow you to purchase the groceries. We see the technology like that becoming more and more accepted uh, in our own country and around the world. Some of you might have seen uh, that uh, uh, yesterday, or rather, uh, I believe it was Friday in the Jerusalem Post, that uh, Syrian rockets came in and were uh, fired against the Demona nuclear uh, nuclear uh, 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 labs and reactor in uh, Israel. And uh, then again yesterday, there were uh, Hamas rockets that were thrust into Israel. And so just like we preached last week, there's this focus on Israel in the days in which we live. And we see all of this taking place, and we realize from it that the time of the coming of the Lord, according to the scripture, is drawing nigh. Now again, no one can predict the exact date. And that's not why we preach prophecy. We're preaching this prophecy so that we'll be living for the Lord when he comes again. That's my hope for all of us as a church. Uh, no one can give the exact date. <clears throat> Many have tried to do that. There was a uh, a pastor by the name of uh, by the name of Hong Ming Chin, and uh, he had what was known as the Chin Cult. They were also known as the Flying Saucer Cult. And uh, one day they determined that uh, as they looked at the map of Texas, they saw a city named Garland, and somehow they mistakenly thought that meant God's land. And so they determined that they would move in 1997. Their entire church of 160 people, they would go down there and they would wait for Jesus Christ to return. They felt that he would be returning in a flying saucer. And so, true story, they all went down to Texas, 160 people. They put on cowboy hats and different kinds of hats. And on March the 31st, 1998, they waited for Jesus to come in a flying saucer. And you guessed it, he didn't come. And so the entire church collapsed. And by the way, it probably should have collapsed because anything that's based upon man's prediction and not based on the Bible is bound to to collapse. And you'll find this morning that everything we're going to be talking about has a basis in the scriptures. In fact, the Bible says in Colossians 1 and verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. We do believe that we have a hope that is laid up for us in heaven and that Jesus Christ will bring us there in his time. And that hope is not based on man's word. It's not based on my word. It's not based on the church's word. It's based on the Bible itself. In fact, look in your notes this morning at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, which says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Now that's what we're studying. We're studying things to come. We have a more sure word of prophecy, of truth. And it says, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. This is a reference, the day dawning to the day of the Lord or the coming of the Lord. Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 
So we're not here this morning studying man's words. The Bible teaches us clearly that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why we refer to the Bible as God's Word. These men who penned the Scriptures were moved by the Holy Ghost. And the prophecies that they gave and the teachings that they gave were not of their own mindset. They were merely the instruments to give to us as holy men of God of old what the Holy Ghost had given to them. And one of the central themes of all of the writings the Holy Ghost gave to these men is the theme of the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning we're going to learn about that. I want you to notice if you have those notes this morning, the prophecy of the rapture. I want you to see that this is a dominant prophecy in the scriptures. In fact, Dr. George Sweeting, the one-time president of the Moody Bible Institute, said that in the Old Testament there are 1,800 references to the coming of Jesus Christ. And that in the New Testament, of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, that there are 300 references to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we would say this morning that it is a frequent promise. In other words, we're not going to take an extant verse and try to build some big truth on that. We're not going to try to wrestle out of the Bible from one little verse what we think the Bible is saying about the coming of Jesus Christ. This is something that is frequently mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned as a sure promise in the Bible. In fact, if you'll notice what Titus said here in, uh, in Paul writing to Titus in verse number 13, he says, looking for the blessed hope. We're looking for uh, the blessed hope. In other words, the early Christians were living their lives with a thought of his coming always in their mind. It was something they were anticipating, something they were looking for. It wasn't something that might happen to them. It was something they were expecting. The Bible says in Philippians 3 and verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior. So he says our lifestyle, our thoughts, our, our heavenly thoughts, we're looking for the Savior. Hebrews 9 28 says it this way. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Here we see it again. The early church is to be looking for, and they were looking for the coming of Christ. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. And when the chief shepherd, that's another name for Jesus, when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now we could go on and on and on this morning, but I think you're beginning to see that there is a theme throughout the scriptures that Christ will appear and that we're to be looking for his appearance. We'll see many other verses along that line. But again, we're not taking just a little part of a verse and creating this thought that Jesus is coming again. This is a theme of the scriptures. And many times today, Christians just kind of neglect the scriptures and hence they do not live expectantly. Hence they do not live hopefully. They are being continually programmed by the news channels and by the bad news and by social media. And you would think that we're on the losing side by hearing all of this. That's why we need to come to the word of God and get to the more sure word of prophecy to remember the fact that Jesus Christ will appear and that he alone is our blessed hope. That's why the word of God is the great differential in our lives each and every day. Now I heard of a story of a fellow that smoked cigarettes and, and he really, really didn't want to and he was uh, doing a lot of reading different articles and different things and he became very alarmed over the strong relationship between smoking and lung cancer. And he finally confided in a friend. He said, I've been reading so many articles about smoking and lung cancer that I've decided to stop reading. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that have stopped reading. And they're making the wrong decision. Folks, let's remember that we want to come to the Word of God when it comes to this matter of understanding things to come, because it is a frequent promise indeed. It's sure we're to be looking for it. It's a securing promise. Remember in John chapter 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And in verse 3, he said, and if I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, say the next part with me, I will come again. How about this? The Lord's table. 
You know, oftentimes when we come to church and we have the Lord's table six or seven times a year, if we're not careful, pastor can stand up and preach. And some of us can have the mental attitude, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I've heard this before. We've done this before. And we sometimes miss little key phrases that really make a difference, like this one. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death, next three words, till he come. What was Jesus saying? Jesus said, every time you have the bread and the juice, I want you to remember that I died and shed my blood. And I want you to keep doing that and keep doing that until I come. So Jesus clearly told his church, I want you to be looking. I want you to be expecting. And the angel said, as Jesus ascended up into heaven after that first morning, after that resurrection morning, and the, and the 1,500 disciples had seen him, now the Bible says that the angel looked to the disciples and said unto them, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye there gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus which was taken from you will so come again in like manner. In other words, the same Jesus will come again physically, literally, like he ascended up into heaven he will descend for his church. And so it's a frequent promise, and it is a factual promise. I want you to notice this. Now, some people get confused between the rapture and the second coming. Just remember this simple thought. It will help you in studying the Bible. With the rapture, Jesus will meet his church in the air. Okay, just remember that phrase, in the air. With the second coming, he will come down to the earth and establish his kingdom. And we'll study the second coming a few weeks from right now. But this morning, let's learn about the rapture, which means the catching away of the church. And the very best passage to do that is going to be found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So let's turn there, just go back a few pages in your Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and let's look beginning at verse 13. And we're going to read down through verse number 18. We've already seen that this is a frequent promise. Let's see the factual details of the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. And it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those which are asleep. Now let's pause here for just a moment and get some background. It appears that the people at Thessalonica had written a letter to the Apostle Paul wondering about those that had already died, but they never got to be resurrected to see Jesus Christ. So he writes to them and he says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those that are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now in this passage we see six facts about the rapture, and I want to share them with you very quickly this morning. And for some that are newer in the Lord, this might be like, wow, I didn't know this stuff was in the Bible. You're going to find the Bible is a wonderful book, and let's learn these six facts together. First we learn here that the Lord himself will come. Notice that in verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. So we are expecting the Lord himself. Secondly, we will hear the shout of the Lord and we will hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God according to verse 16. The voice of Jesus calling us up to himself. The voice of the archangel, perhaps Michael, will sound out his voice in calling the church. And then the Bible says there will be the trump of God that will sound. Now 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says it this way, and at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. Now in Bible times, trumpets were sound to congregate people together, to bring people together. And the Bible says that the Lord will sound off and will call us 
the archangel will call us and the trump of God will sound. And so we see the Lord will come and there will be a voice and there will be a trumpet sound. And then the Bible says, the dead in Christ shall rise. Verse 16, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now these are those who have died during this church age. And someone says, well, I thought they were with the Lord. And they are. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Someone that dies in Christ is instantly with the Lord. There is a soul consciousness. I believe there's an understanding of the love of God, the presence of Jesus. But on the day of the rapture, their body, which was sown in incorruption, will be raised and it will now be an in incorruptible body. The dead in Christ will rise first. They will receive their body at the day of the rapture. And so the relationship that they have in Christ guarantees that they will be raised up to incorruption. The key chapter on that subject is 1 Corinthians 15. And in verse 52, the Bible says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. By the way, remember, remember that the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible, right? And so you begin to read two and three times about these things and you realize, well, the Bible says that there will be the sounding of the trump. The trumpet will sound. And notice this, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed, right? Now, don't take the Bible out of context. Don't, don't do what some people would do. Oh, the Bible says at the last trump, the trump will sound. President Trump's done. It's going to go any time now. That's not what it's talking about, right? And some people do silly things like that. But the Bible says that there will be a trumpet that will sound, and the dead shall be raised, and we shall all be changed. But the key is, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. What a great day that will be to stand before the Lord complete, to stand there in an incorruptible body. I'm telling you, that will be a great day. You will not have to get up after that day and take medicine. You will not get out of bed and hear snap, crackle, pop. You will not have to go to a dentist ever again in your life. That ought to be worth one amen for some of you. It will be a wonderful day to have an incorruptible body. And the Bible says that when we are with him, that we will be changed in that moment. And then fourthly, it says that Christians will be caught up to join them in the air. So the dead in Christ rise first, and they receive their incorruptible body. And then verse 17 says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Now the phrase caught up is the Greek word rapturo, from which we get the word rapture. It speaks, of course, of a catching away of the saints. And it says that we will meet the Lord in the air. It tells us that this will happen in a moment's time. The Greek word here in 1 Corinthians 15 for moment is atomos, and it means indivisible, that which cannot be divided. In other words, in a split second, the church will be carried away. Now, I would love to hear Don Lemon and some of these other liberal unsafe commentators trying to explain it away on the news that night. There were a billion people that left planet Earth tonight. We believe it was UFOs that stole them, but we're not 100% sure. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know what their, what their way of explaining it away will be, but the Bible says they're not even going to see it. It's going to be in a millisecond. Boom! The church of Jesus Christ is caught up to be with the Lord, changed in the instant of that moment, and forever with the Lord. Again, this will happen so fast it cannot be divided or measured by time. Now the second coming will, will show us that the Lord Jesus will descend to the earth. Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And they will see the Lord descending down with clouds. And, uh, and yet on the rapture, the Lord Jesus will call us to be with him. And then notice number five, we will meet the Lord in the air. The Bible tells us meeting the Lord in the air. And then it says here in 1 Thessalonians 4, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So I believe that by the time you read through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, by the time you read 1 Corinthians and these other passages in Titus, you begin to realize, you know, this truth of the rapture of the church is not just a little something, but it is a major theme in the Bible. The prophecy of the rapture is clear. Notice secondly, the promise of the rapture. 
the promise or the hope that the rapture brings. Remember in Titus 2.13 it said, looking for that blessed hope. This is the promise. Our hope is not found in a political party. It's not found in, in a church. It is found in a person. And we are looking for him. He is our blessed hope. Now let's bear this in mind and make sure that we understand, again, the timing, at least in general terms. Let me share a few thoughts with you here, if I can have that slide here. Notice, if you would, we're living currently in the church age. At the end of this time, the Bible teaches that there will be a catching away of the saints. The rapture will take place. Jesus comes and calls us unto himself. There will be a meeting in the air. That will usher in the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. We'll have an entire message on that a few weeks from now. The tribulation period, sometimes called the time of Jacob's trouble, or the 70th week of Daniel, uh, this is a time that at first will seem to the world like peace has come. The Antichrist, this centralized government, all of this will seem to bring peace. But then the Bible says sudden destruction will come and the great tribulation will begin. I believe the church will be raptured prior to the great tribulation and then will return with Jesus at his second coming when he establishes his kingdom. So bear that in mind and I'll share a few verses with you as to why we believe that the rapture is our imminent hope that the second coming will follow the rapture. Notice, if you would, the imminent hope of the rapture. We believe that this hope is our blessed hope. We believe that it is imminent, that it could happen at any moment because the church is not appointed to wrath. In the Bible, the church is not appointed to wrath. Now, if you have your Bible open to 1 Thessalonians, look at chapter 5. And notice a few verses here. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. But when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Notice if you would in verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So in describing the time of the tribulation, the Bible then inserts in verse 9 that the church, the Christians, are not appointed to this time of wrath. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10 says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, watch this phrase now, which delivered us from the wrath of to come. And so we believe that the tribulation time or the wrath that will come upon this earth will happen after the catching away of the church, which is called the rapture. Dr. John Wolvert of Dallas Seminary once wrote, while scripture presents many signs of Christ's second coming and the establishment of his coming kingdom, there are no predicted events preceding the rapture. It could happen in a moment. And so we see in the scriptures that the church is not appointed to wrath. Secondly, we see that the church is absent from the Bible in Revelation chapters 6 through 18. The significance of that is that all of the judgments of the Great Tribulation are mentioned in chapter 6 through 18, but never is the church mentioned during those times and during those chapters. Thirdly, we believe it is promised that the church will not have the judgment of the Great Tribulation upon it. Revelation 3 and 10 to the church at Philadelphia, the Bible says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now this term, the hour of temptation, speaks of Daniel's 70th week. It speaks of this time of Jacob's trouble when the earth will have great tribulation. But the Bible says in Revelation 3 and verse number 10, I will keep thee from the hour of this tribulation. Behold, he says, I come quickly. In other words, my coming for you, church, is imminent. I will keep you from the time of tribulation that Israel will experience experience before their repentance during that time of great judgment. And finally, I believe the rapture to take place simply because of the order of the scripture. 
Remember a moment ago we were reading 1 Thessalonians 4, and it talked about the catching away of the believers. It talked about the dead in Christ rising, we which are alive and remain, joining them in the air. When you come to chapter 5, you begin to read about the wrath to come. You begin to read about peace and safety, then sudden destruction. And so we see from these passages an order. And so we believe that the Christian has an imminent hope in the rapture of the church. Again, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is an imminent hope, and it is an inspirational hope. It's something that should challenge and encourage our hearts. Let me give you a few reasons why. All right. First of all, it is a hope because it tells us that not every believer will see death. Now, how many of you, just to be honest, would say, you know, I would, I would really love to be a part of that group that goes straight up to be with the Lord. How many of you are on that side? I'd love it if the Lord came today. It, it's something that is a promise that not every believer will see death. In fact, in your notes, it's 1 Corinthians 15, 51. It says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Now this is the key verse of our church nursery, so take a look at it again. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. All right, that's a joke. If you didn't get it, you're slow. That's all, it's not a bad joke. You're slow, that's why you didn't get it, so. What does that verse mean? We shall not all sleep. It means not everyone's going to die, that, that not everyone will die preceding the coming of the Lord, but we will all be changed. So whether someone precedes us in death in Christ, or whether it's someone that is alive when Jesus comes, all of us are going to be changed. All of us are going to receive that incorruptible body. So there's great inspiration in that. And then the greatest thing is this, that we will one day see Christ. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And you know, the greatest thing about this message this morning is the simple truth that one day we're going to see the Lord face to face. Now it's through a glass darkly. Now we understand to the best of our abilities, but then face to face, we will see the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that moment, we will receive our glorified body. Now I've referenced this a couple of times, but let's just take a look at the notes there at 1 Corinthians 15, 52. What do we mean when we talk about a new body? The Bible says in verse 52, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You see, when we have a funeral service, and we go over to the memorial park, and we lay somebody's body in the ground, that is a moment of corruption. The corruptible body is sown, but at the time of the rapture, that body will be raised and it will become incorruptible. And with a new body, an eternal incorruptible body, we will dwell with Jesus for all of eternity. And there is great inspiration in that. And I'm telling you, if you're not looking for it now, you will when a loved one passes away. And this is a great reason to invite folks to church. This is a great reason to tell people of the gospel so that they can have the same hope that we have, that one day they will be with Jesus for all of eternity in an incorruptible body. And so what an amazing thought. No more medicine. No more doctor's appointments. No more CDC. Hey, Dr. Fauci has to retire. I'm telling you, this will be a great day. Why? Because in heaven there is no sickness, there is no disease, and there is no death. Amen? Amen. Everyone has an incorruptible body there. I heard about a couple that was celebrating their 50th uh, wedding anniversary, and, and uh, they decided they would go back to the hotel where they had their honeymoon, and so they were laying in bed, and the wife got a little bit sentimental, and she said to her husband, she said, darling, do you remember how you stroked my hair when we first got married? And so he did what a you know, smart husband, he can take the hint, he did, he did what he's supposed to do. He reached over, and he began to stroke her hair. And, and he, she said, do you remember how you cuddled with me? And so he kind of got over there and cuddled a little bit. And she said, and you remember how you used to nibble my ear? And he got out of bed. She said, where are you going? He said, I got to get my teeth. <laughs> None of that in heaven, amen. It's going to be an incorruptible body, an incorruptible body. The prophecy of the rapture is clearly seen. The promise of the rapture gives us hope 
inspiration. And I want you to see finally this morning the preparation. In the scriptures, God has given us time and time again his promise that he will appear. I will appear. I will come again. I will come again. If someone says to you, hey, I'm going to be by your house tomorrow at 10. Let's just say someone that you would respect, someone of import, uh, the manager of your company, the highest up boss in the division where you work. And someone says, hey, I'm going to come by. I want to talk to your house tomorrow. More likely than not, you'd get ready for that person's coming. More than likely, you'd do some vacuuming. You'd cut the lawn. If you're like my wife, you'd light 50 or 100 candles. <laughs> you do something to get ready because you want to let this person know that you value their presence there. Does it not then seem to you that if Jesus Christ is coming again, that we should be thinking about how we should be prepared for such a day? And that if it's imminent, if there's nothing else that needs to happen before his coming, that we should be ready. Let me give you a few ways to be ready. Every one of us must be ready for this rapture. How many of you remember reading the books years ago, uh, Left Behind by Tim LaHaye? Any of you read those books? If you didn't read them, they're good reads. And uh, they're based on scripture. They're somewhat fictional, but they're just great, enjoyable reading. Tim LaHaye was a godly man wrote me a note years ago and sent a generous check for our Bible college. He had a heart for the things of the Lord. And he tried to help people get ready for this coming of the Lord. And, and this is certainly something to be ready for. Many will reject the Lord. Many will be under a strong delusion, Second Thessalonians talks about. They, they, they will have rejected Christ, and they will be more ready for the Antichrist. You know, they're, they're going to be so into their spirituality and their, their, uh, their way of thinking. They're going to be so into their wokeness and so uh, inebriated with their alcohol and high with their pot that, that they're going to be ready for that one world government. You know, uh, everybody, everybody just coming together. We are the world. We can solve our own problems without God. That will be the general feeling of the populace. But there will be some who are not looking for the Antichrist. They are looking for the Christ. And I hope that you are of that number. And the only way that you can be ready for the coming of the Christ is first, that you will experience salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says it this way. For if we believe, would you say that with me? For if we believe, very critical. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. God will not bring us to be with Christ unless we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is only going to draw unto himself those who have his nature, those who believe on his name. So it is very important that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that word believe means to completely trust in him, to place your confidence in him. It doesn't mean to add Jesus to your God shelf or to one of your hobbies. It means that you are trusting in no one and nothing other than Jesus Christ to cover your sin. So if we believe, that's what is said in John 11 and verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And so belief in Christ is a complete confidence in Christ. And the only way that we'll live for all of eternity is to put our faith in him. Now, Jesus has promised his coming. The question is, have you made your reservation for that great day? Forty years ago, I took Terry up to San Jose, California, where we both grew up. We went to the Japanese garden. I had on a nice suit. She looked beautiful. It was a special date. In my coat pocket of my blue plaid leisure suit, I had an engagement ring. I waited till we got on just the right bridge I, I was so thirsty I could hardly talk, and, and, and I got down on one knee. I took her hand, I put the ring on her hand, and said, will you marry me? She looked at me. She paused just enough to make me nervous, and then she smiled and said yes. Oh, I was so glad. But we were not married at that point. Oh, she made a decision that day, and I had made a decision. We made a commitment. But several months later, we stood at the altar of a Baptist church. And on that day, on that day, we pledged our love eternally to one another. On that day, 
I claimed her as my bride. May I say to you that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are making a reservation and that one day Jesus Christ will appear to claim his bride. But we must, prior to his coming, make sure that we have committed our lives to him, that we have trusted Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior. The only way to be ready for the rapture is to know that you are saved, that your sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, if you would say, well, pastor, I'm saved, then let me give you a second way to be ready for his coming, and we'll be done. And that is through sanctification. That's kind of a big word, but let me just break it down real quickly. That word reply, uh, applies that it implies that we are a people that are living a life set apart to him. In other words, I made a pledge to Terry. I made a pledge to be faithful to Terry. And, and, and that was a pledge in marriage. But being saved means that Jesus is your Lord. And it means you're going to be faithful to him as your Lord. And, and, and this is a life that is set apart unto him. My life is set apart unto Terry in the sense of marriage. But God says, I want your life to be set apart unto me in the sense of relationship. It is a sanctified life. Now, now to give you the thought of this, look in your notes at 1 John 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Be, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. If you truly believe that one day you're going to see Jesus Christ face to face, then we need to make sure that we are readying ourselves for that moment. Like the mother that put her, came, came to see her little son one, one morning and get him out of bed, and she looked at her little son, and she saw that he was dirty from head to toe. He had grease and dirt and muck. And, he, and, and she said, how did you get that way? And the little boy said, oh, it's easy, Mom. I went to bed this way. And many people go to bed night after night after night with sin in their heart, with hate, with covetousness, with whatever kind of sin you want to name. And God wants us to repent of that. He wants us to confess that to him. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, when Jesus comes, you don't want to be partying and being unfaithful and being wicked in your lifestyle. When Jesus comes, if you want to be ready, the Bible says, not me, the Bible says, purify yourself. Be ready for him to come. And so even if you're saved, we should live every day with this thought, what if the Lord came today? Boy, if the Lord came today, I have a friend that's not saved. I have a neighbor that needs Christ. I have a doctor that's not saved. I have a relative. When you begin to live that way, it changes the way you think about things. It causes you to think more about the eternal. It causes you to think about, instead of making all your decisions based upon the temporal of this world, well, I got this, therefore I can go there, there I can buy and sell and get gain, like, like we see so often in Scripture. Uh, and, and instead of making our own plans, we begin to think, what should I do in light of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? And he says, sanctify yourself. Sanctify yourself through repentance. Sanctify yourself by denying ungodliness. Sanctify yourself through steadfastness. I want you to see one final verse in your notes. And notice what it says here. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another and provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more, say this last part with me, as, as you see the day approaching. God says, look it, if you're saved, I want that coming day when I come back, I want that to motivate you to be faithful now. I want you to realize that this is a reason why we're in church. And so he says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Now, I've said this before, and I'm not like crying the blues or something, but this last year has been probably, probably one of the hardest years I've ever had to be a pastor. And I'm not going to give you my big list of all the woes of it. I'm not here to put a burden on you. I hope to lift yours maybe a little bit. But just, just to give you an illustration... It has been challenging with respect to all the laws and the medical things and 
trying to keep church going and encourage people to come back, but not encourage too much, and all this, all this stuff this last year. It's, it's been a challenge. Because on one side of me, there's a pastor's heart that everything within me wants to be protective of the health of our church family. I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. And so to the extent that I understood that, I've tried to be so, so very careful to that. On the other side, there is a tremendous passion within me to lead our church to be a biblical church obedient to the word of God. And there are people watching me this morning and they have underlying conditions. They should be uh, right now not around crowds. They're in chemo, they're heart patients, whatever. But there is the other side that says, well, now wait a minute. These same many times folks that are members of the church, they're at Walmart, they're working 40 hours. And so I've never been one to try to lead with guilt, not to try to lay a big guilt trip on everybody to do whatever they do. So I've just kind of been having services and kind of doing my thing. And so even this verse is not one that I just pulled out to mention about church attendance. It actually happens to be a part of the text of the message today because it's talking about the reason we should not forsake the assembling is because the day is approaching. So how many of you would give me a little bit of credit this morning? It actually ties into the sermon. Are you with me right now? And the Bible's pretty clear. Forsake not the assembling. That's like getting together <laughs> of yourselves together. Tonight I'll bring a very important message entitled Together. How God wants to use a people together for his glory. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. God bless you for being here. Let's keep assembling together. The Christian life is designed that way. It, it's hard to take the Lord's table at home. It's hard to bear a burden at home. It's hard sometimes to really function as a body uh, when we're separate. Thank God we have some togetherness online, but God has created his church to be a place together, and we need this so much the more as we see the day approaching. There's so much discouragement. We need to get together and encourage one another. This morning, we see the prophecy of the rapture. Jesus said, I will call you to meet me in the air. This morning, we, we see the tremendous promise of the rapture, that this is a promise of hope and inspiration, a new body and an eternal home. And then we see we better be preparing for that. We better make sure that we are saved. We better make sure that we are living for Jesus when he comes again, there might be some change he wants to make in your life, even today, in light of his imminent return. And I pray that you will. Let's stand together this morning, shall we? And let's have a word of prayer as we've heard this truth. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I want to thank you this morning, Lord, for the great, great hope that you give us. You tell us that you're coming again for us. And we know, Lord, that we can't predict the day or the hour but we just find great hope in the promise. And I ask you to help us to be ready for that time. Help us to prepare for that day when we see you face to face. Our heads are bowed this morning and our eyes are closed. And I wonder how many in this auditorium this morning would say, Pastor Chapel, as I understand the scripture, I have made the reservation. I'm ready for that day when he will appear. I'm looking forward to it. I believe my sins are under the blood. I've been declared righteous. And I believe that I have a reserved home in heaven. I'm not afraid when I hear talk about catching away with the Lord. I'm encouraged by it. That's my heart's hope and my testimony. I've been saved and I look forward to seeing the Lord someday. In my heart, I believe this to be true. Would you lift your hand if that's your hope, that's your testimony? That is wonderful. It's a blessed hope, blessed hope. Who's here right now? You say, Pastor Chapel, when I hear about, you know, second coming, rapture, battle of Armageddon, all this stuff, it, I just get butterflies, and I'm not sure that I'm ready to see the Lord. I mean, if he came today, I don't know that I would be called up with him. And I would like to get that settled. I would like to be ready for that day. I don't know for sure that I'm saved, that I have a home in heaven, but if there's a way to be ready for that, I would like to be ready. Pastor Chapel, you mentioned salvation. I need that. God's speaking to my heart right now. If you sense that need, if you need to be ready for the coming of the Lord, would you allow me to pray for you this morning? Would you just quietly, right now, just lift your hand and say, I'm one of those. Pray for me. I didn't lift it before. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. 
Thank you, sir. Who else this morning? Thank you in the back. Who else this morning? Thank you, sir. God bless you. Who else? I'm not quite ready yet. I want to be ready, but I don't think I am. Who else would say, I'm not ready. I need to be made ready. Pray for me. God bless you. I'm going to pray. I see your hand, ma'am. I'm going to pray for you. This is the most important decision you ever make in your life to get ready for the coming of the Lord. How many of you that have accepted Christ, you believe you're already heaven bound, would say, Pastor, there's some things in my life that I need to lay down before the Lord and purify myself. I need to start living my life with that imminency in mind. I want to live tomorrow and this week with that in my mind. God spoke to me about it. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand this morning? Imminency changes a lot of things. Father, bless the Christians who need to live their life with your return in their heart and mind. And then bless these several who said, I'm not quite ready. And Lord, would you bring them today, bring them to that place of decision where they will trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. And, and if they believe, they will have eternal life. So bring them to that point of faith, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song right now, our closing song of invitation. If you're not sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and that heaven is your home, if you lifted your hand, and several of you did, and you said, I'm not sure, when this song starts, I want to encourage you to just step out from where you are, come and see one of these men here at the front, and just say, I need to get ready for the rapture. I'm not ready right now, but I need to get ready. If you're a Christian that needs to come and pray and prepare yourself, or you're looking for a church home or have questions about things, this is for you. So right now when the song begins, especially if you need to be ready for the rapture, you step out. We'll wait for you. Just come right now. If God spoke to your heart from the back, from the front here, you come. If God spoke to your heart today, in the back here, just come right on up. Someone will talk to you. And you don't have to be embarrassed. God bless you, ma'am. We're glad you came. God bless you. Others are coming. You just step out. We'll wait for you. This is the most important decision we ever make in our life. And just come like you are. God will forgive you. He'll help you. If you hear a spirit calling, you just step out. And there's someone here to help you. Come receive Christ the King. Come and live forever.